I want you to see this. Now we're facing probably the greatest fight we've ever seen, the greatest threat. Like I said, men rose up in 1776 in this nation to, to stand for that beacon of freedom that, was, that God lit in their hearts, and they won it against impossible odds. Then we see things coming along. World War I, we had, we had a generation that rose up and stood, allies from all around the world to keep that light burning inside their hearts. Then we turned and we seen World War II, the greatest threat we've ever seen, when a totally demon-possessed man named Hitler stood up on Satan's throne and, and commenced to try to an, uh, annihilate the Jewish race. Then a generation rose up in those days and fought. Then we see Vietnam. We see, we see uh, uh, Korea, Vietnam. We see all these wars and things around the world that we've never even heard of. And now it falls to our generation. But our generation faces the greatest thing probably ever. Because you see the, the facets of all of these at one time. All of them at one time all the way from the days of Pharaoh, all at one time. And he has technology to aid him, something to drill into the public's head, to drill into everyone's mind, this perceived new world. They call it the new normal, the new normal. And so they want you to see their world so you make decisions according to their world. And technology is aiding, but then he has something on the other hand. The second weapon he has is something he's never had before. He has a large majority of the church agreeing with him. Churches that open their door and take your temperature before they'll let you come in. Churches that won't dare lay their hands on your head and pray for your healing because you have a fever and the church that's supposed to be the extended hand of God laid upon your head, the five-fold ministry, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher standing there in the full power and the vision of God that we were, that, that we were raised with Jesus when he was raised from the dead and we have no fear of death. So we put our hands on it and the lightnings of God flash out of our spirit into those people's bodies. And when we lay hands on their brow, the healing power of God goes through their very bloodstream, through their soul, and charges their body with healing until there is no sickness, no variance. Nothing can come against that because the power of God is the power of resurrection that can raise the dead. Instead, the churches, the big part of the churches close their doors and say, if you have a temperature, we cannot allow you in our church. Because why don't they add to their, their declaration? Because we have no power at all to combat even a common cold. So what are you sitting in your services with your hands raised for? Are you raising them up? Only one reason you could possibly have them up in the air. Because you're saying, I surrender. I surrender. Well, you know, Brother Rodman, we just have to be now. We have to be really careful about this. Jesus said, be careful for nothing. We have to be real. We have to use wisdom. That's another phrase for saying we're full of unbelief. And don't have any power. Well, you know, we just, uh, there's some things God, we, we just don't understand that God don't want us to understand Then he shouldn't have put it in your copy of the book. All these are just cop-outs. They're all cop-outs so that you can receive offerings, get your pockets full, but never put your hand and risk yourself on one sickness. When the leper came to Jesus and said, you can make me clean, Lord, if you will. He didn't know the will of God. He didn't know if God wanted to put his hands on something like that, where you put your hands on it and, they, and the, the, the swelled pustles of, of pus 
burst open under your fingers and you, you're laying your hands in that sticky mess of the contagion that wiped out people by the thousands. He didn't know if he wanted to lay his hands on that. But Jesus looked at him and he didn't say, Peter, check his temperature. Peter, see if he's had a jab card. We've got to see if he's got a proof of his jab that, that he's been inoculated. Jesus looked at him and you could see the eyes of the master burning with that same flame of freedom that he brought to this earth. Couldn't you see him? He looked at the challenge of that and his eyes got bright because he is the light and the power of God started shining through his face. And he looked at that leper and said, well, of course I will be clean. And he laid his hands on that totally unafraid. And the Bible said, watch this. It didn't say he was just healed. It said the leprosy departed from him. The sickness itself, that living entity, stuck its head up and just and ran off and went back into the world of the damned where it belonged. And so he wasn't afraid. And we're his body. We're his body. You find in John, St. John, when he rose from the dead, my brother and sister, listen to me. When he rose from the dead, he called his men to him. He surrounded himself with his disciples. And, and he said, the scripture said, he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. He breathed on them. What was he breathing on? What was he breathing on them? He had just risen from his conquest in hell. He had just defeated death, hell, and the grave. He took every sickness, every plague, every disease, and he paid the price <laughs> in the pit of the damned. And he rose from the dead and left it laying there along with your and my sin. And he came out and he said, the consciousness is in me that I have defeated it all. Now I want to breathe it upon you so that you walk burning with the consciousness that I live in. He is the head. We are the body. And he said, receive the Holy Ghost. That's why those men would pray for people with no fear. They would come up to the dead and raise the dead with no fear. It's because they were burning with the greatest consciousness a generation had ever seen. And so this whole perception to rob us of the power of the resurrection is what has been done to us now. And this generation is fighting the greatest enemy of this we've ever seen. Technology focuses one program after another program after another program. And you see now those men and women that sit in Congress and the Senate, they're all in these congressional meetings. And watch this. They're not burning with the fire and the blaze of the, of the first founding fathers, which was the consciousness of the risen Savior. That's what George Washington had in him. That's what all of those founding fathers had in them. They had the consciousness. Did you realize that they would sit in Congress and John Adams wrote his wife, Abigail, and he said, you've got to see Psalm 35. Look at what God showed us in Psalm 35, because they didn't just open Congress with prayer. They opened prayer, a prayer meeting in Congress in his day that lasted three hours. And then they went into a Bible study and they found out a message in Psalm 35. It's obvious that in our founding fathers, this flame that Jesus breathed into his men was burning brightly in our hearts. One of the founding fathers that was there, one of the presidents later, he was only eight years old during 1776, but he trained at eight years old as a minute man with his musket drills. Later in the 1800s, they asked him to speak, and he spoke of Christmas, and he spoke of July the 4th. And this is what he said. He said Christmas, the celebration of Jesus' birth, was the celebration of Jesus bringing Christian principles into the world. And he said, July the 4th, when we, when we declare the Declaration of Independence, was a nation bringing those principles into a government. He saw it as an extension of the same thing. It was the same 
bless God, fire that burned inside those men and the allies to freedom all over the world. Same fire. In Russia, it wasn't always communist. There was fiery of Christian belief there. It's there now. There's revival happening there now. That's why you see people protesting in the streets. They don't even realize a lot of them that that fire is what's blazed up in them. But here in this country, where we fought so hard to keep that blaze, we watch congressional meetings now. And we watch a witch stand up that, that obvious, whether knowing or unknowing, is a Baal worshiper. Stand up. Their speeches. And everybody in there so full of fear they can't function. All of them have face coverings on. There is no, there is nothing. Why do you think they all wear them? But they're caught on hidden camera without them. You take a leader of England, made everybody else do what he, what he said to do. But in private, throwing parties where booze flowed free and like water. Booze was just flowing free and they were gathering, call it a business meeting. People this close and nobody with a face covering. It's because they know it's crap. They know it's just crap. They know there's nothing to it. It won't help anything, but it's all designed to change your perception. And if you see the leaders of your nation full of fear, why don't they just come out and stick a pillow over their face and wrap a cord around the back of their neck until all you can hear is a mumble. It would be more inspiring than watch them stand up and squabble around like a bunch of fearful little worms that have no courage at all. George Washington at Valley Forge and so forth, a whole outbreak of smallpox took place, killing people, more killed by smallpox than were dying in the war. You know what that leader did? up and did a bold experiment. He began to d deal with real science and, he, and cured his army of smallpox. He didn't panic. What if he had came on the scene and stood up in front of his men? You just tell me how inspiring this would have been. George Washington stand up with a pillow tied around his face, looking, doing this. Oh, my God, men, I don't know what we're going to do. We're outnumbered of 20,000 to 2,000. I don't know what we're going to do. Everybody run for the hills. He just stood up there in the face of hell because he had that light that Jesus breathed into his disciples burning brightly in him. And now we don't turn on television and watch in America the halls of Congress with courage. We don't see any courage. We see a bunch of cowards. That's all it is, is cowards with pillows tied around their face. Cowards. Don't think I'm just talking about the Democrat Party either. It's not the Democrat Party that God's holding responsible for all this crap that's been let in on the world. It's those who claim to be the, the torch of freedom that held up the conservative principles. It's the Republican Party. They could stop it tomorrow, but they won't do it because they're afraid. You might as well not look to Congress for courage. You look for cowards with something tied around their face. If they had real courage while they're on national television, rip it off their face and throw it on the ground and say, by God, this is finished today. We're standing up imploring the power of Almighty God the way John Adams in the first Congress did. We're bringing that in. We're going to have a three-hour prayer meeting, and if the Democrats don't like it, they can go hide in a hole somewhere. But we're going to do it, and if Madam Speaker beats them with a claw hammer on her desk, why don't one of them go up and take it out of her hand and say, you're finished, witch. There's no more of this mess you're going to perpetrate on God's people. We are calling on the power of the Holy Ghost into these meetings. If you claim to be a Christian, act like one.